Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to episode six of Loops. For all those that are not familiar with the episode, this is a live webinar series focused on shedding light on the innovation produced by the Horizon 2020 funded projects in the field of uh, social innovation and circular economy. I am uh, Daniela Brucoli. I'm in charge of the communication at Velfa, and I'm very happy to be here today. And uh, so uh, today we're going to dive into the agriculture sector, and uh, we're going to do that with the contribution of the Water to Return project and Cybel project, with uh, the, the contribution of Dr. Tapata and Dr. Davy. So uh, before moving into the heart of the episode, I would like our guests to introduce themselves. So uh, Dr. Davy, would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, I'm nice to be here as well. Uh, so my name is Dr. Stephen Davy. I work as head of division for Programmable Economic Systems at Walton Institute for Information, Communications and Systems Sciences. Um, I'm also the project coordinator for uh, H2020 projects like that. So, Dr. Day, Dr. Davy, could you try to speak? Yeah. Is there my problem or? Um. Oh yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, now it's fine. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zapata. Hello, good morning. Good afternoon. In Spain, it's good morning yet. <laughs> uh, my name is Pilar Zapata. I come from my Basul company, which is a Spanish SME. Uh, it's a technological uh, engineering and consultancy uh, located in, in Malaga, in the south of, of Spain. We take care basically of uh, water management uh, from the technological point of view, but we also have a stronger uh, uh, profile regarding um, um, projects and technological consultancy. So we are the coordinators of Water to Return project and it will be a pleasure to actually present it to all of you. Thank, thank you, thank you very much for this short introduction. Okay, so I'm just gonna give uh, the participants uh, a general overview of what the episode uh, will be structured. So um, now each of the project coordinators is going to deliver a short presentation of their projects and after that, there's going to be room for a Q&A session. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions to you both. And then, uh, of course, there's going to be room for questions from our audience. So we're really looking forward to hearing from them. And so if you have any questions, submit them in the, in the event page on LinkedIn or during the live streaming on YouTube. So now I'll give the floor to uh, Dr. Davy, who's going to talk about the Cybel project. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here as well. And uh, the project I'm gonna speak about is the Cybel. Um, Cybel project was funded under Horizon I ICT 11 and the Horizon 2020. Um, it's just 31 partners involved and there's 14 countries. It's a, a quite a large project. It's a 14 million euro innovation action. Um, an innovation action again. It's it's looking to bring results to the market of, of research that that's being brought into the project. Uh, there's nine demonstrators as part of the project, and I'm going to give a little bit of information on those today. Uh, they're all agriculture related. Uh, it started on the first of January, uh, 2019. Uh, so we're about two and a half years into it. Uh, we're in the kind of the final year now, so we're really looking at uh, exploiting those results from the project. Uh, if I was to list a few keywords from the project, it would be high performance computing, big data, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, uh, precision livestock farming, precision agriculture. Let's just kind of uh, step back and look at the challenge that the project is looking to uh, address. Uh, primarily, it's looking at the issues around food waste and food waste crisis. Um, amazingly, there's one third of all food that's produced around the world ends up in a landfill and it just goes wasted. Uh, so it's a huge social and economic problem. Uh, there's also lots of, of, of dimensions and challenges around it. It's not just, can't just be solved with one, one technology. There's lots of different aspects to it. Uh, the approach that Cybele is taking 
is looking at it from a digital transformation perspective, trying to bring digital technologies into agriculture, into the, into the agricultural um, production uh, value chain, and looking at all the different ways that technology can play a role. Um, you know, technology is it's, it's all around, uh, especially in agriculture, looking at how can you know machinery or autonomous systems or artificial intelligence or or monitoring uh, your 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 field how can that actually benefit the, the, the farm managers um, and we're look, we're looking at leveraging high performance computing in particular uh, high performance computing you can think about it as you know these supercomputers that you know they predict the weather or they do you know gene code sequencing um, they're they, they're able to crunch huge amount of numbers, large volumes of data, um, and we're looking at these technologies as a way of of um, bringing them into agriculture. But one of the main concerns that we have or that we've seen is that HPCs they're just not accessible to most organisations, particularly agri tech organisations. Uh, they don't know how to access them. They don't know how to develop their software to run on these high performance computing, um, or even get their data into these platforms. So this is really a difficult challenge for for some of these organisations. And then on the, on the other side, we have the European Commission investing in high performance computing. Uh, they want these systems to be used, um, and so not just by scientists, but also by these these. Uh, potentially startup organizations that, that want to be able to compete. So we've identified some of the main uh, issues. It's around the lack, lack of big data experience, the lack of artificial intelligence or machine learning expertise, uh, the difficulty in, in develop, deploying IoT sensor networks, and just the lack of experience in accessing uh, high performance computing algorithms and, and processes. Um, what we're hoping to get is to be able to resolve all those issues, to be able to resolve those issues so that farm managers and, 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 and uh, you know, farm food production companies, they will have data at their fingertips, such as weather data, soil temperatures, you know, sea conditions, um, you know, pollen counts. So all this information at, at their fingertips, so they'll be able to use it to make more informed decisions around their uh, productions. So being able to classify the quality of crops in, in different areas to be able to come up with really really um targeted fertilization plans or if we're looking at livestock farming potentially being able to identify the optimal weight of, of pigs for slaughter or to be able to look at herd behavior uh, in real time um, or if you're looking in the aquaculture area to be able to pinpoint where is the best location in in, in the open sea to go fishing um, and if they can get these better decisions then they, they can have much more improved outcomes. So improved outcomes could look like better food quality, uh, longer shelf life, um, you know, a, a better way to differentiate their products on the shelf so they'll have a, a higher degree of, of quality in their products, potentially be able to open up new markets for their businesses. And, and all these would be working towards less food waste uh, or you know, better recycling of, of, of food. So the project looked at kind of three technology areas that we can make enhancements on and, and specifically around HPC. So what is HPC abstractions? So that's making HPC environments much more accessible. So by, by, by re, re, removing the need to have very specialist expertise in these systems. Uh, artificial and machine learning templates. So that's also eliminating the need to have high skilled uh, expertise in, in this area, you can use off the shelf models and to apply them to your own organization's needs. And also looking at um, being able to search and query and categorize your data in a very intelligent way. And that's through the intelligent query building uh, interface. Just to look at, you know, briefly, uh, I'm going to look take, take three of the, the scenarios that we we look at uh, but this is a, the nine demonstrators here so we have organic soya uh, yield production we have food we have uh, climate services for our um, organic food production we have autonomous systems that look at uh, arable crops uh, we have uh, crop yield prediction systems and then in precision livestock farming we have pig weight optimization uh, sustainable pig production open sea fishing and, and aquaculture monitoring and, and feed optimization. So they're, they're the, particularly they're the agriculture scenarios.
So I'm going to take, take just a little bit of detail in, into uh, tr three particular areas, just to give you an idea of where HPC comes in and how the Cybella project adds value. So if we look at pig analysis, for example, uh, pig video analysis, in a typical pig farm, you might have five or 600 pigs, uh, but you might only have you know three or four manual uh, staff to be able to manage those pigs. And one of the difficult challenges they have is trying to make sure the pigs are at the right weight for slaughter, or also do the pigs exhibit some uh, anomalous behavior? Are they, are they uh, uncomfortable in, in their, in their uh, pig pens? So we're looking at using uh, computer vision techniques. So computer vision techniques are able to take in a video image, for example, and instead of uh, you know sending that video off to be looked at by a human, we have trained algorithms to be able to look at that video. And for example, to be able to identify what's the pig weight or what's the average pig weight in a pig pen? Or are, is there an anonymous um, behaviors from the pigs? And to have that information fed to the uh, fig, uh, pig production managers, rather than them having to look at video or to have staff out looking at each of the pig pens. So it's saving them time and effort uh, so they can actually um, be much more effective in their job. So HPCs come in, in, in are involved because training the camera to be able to actually identify pig weight or identify pig behavior takes a lot of compute power uh, you know to get that algorithm uh, you know accurate for it to be put onto the camera so that's where hpcs come into place so be able to crunch the data to get that algorithm uh, fit for purpose for those cameras similarly if you're looking at satellite imagery uh, you know computer vision techniques can be trained as well um, and in satellite imagery, uh, the, the, the issue there is that there's so much, so much data, there's terabits and terabits of, of imagery data that would need to be analyzed and processed. Uh, and that's some of the challenges that uh, SIA yield prediction is looking at. So this, uh, this in this figure, figure here, we're looking at uh, an overhead satellite view of a typical SIA field. And you can see the gradient in the colors uh, is showing where is a really high quality grain versus a lower quality grain. And if you jump to the next part, you can see these, these classification lines. It's actually showing if the, if the farmer, um, you know, uh, collects the crop in that particular line, they have a class A product. And if they collect it in a red line, they have a class B product. So they can actually separate their products on the farm into higher quality protein, higher quality soybeans and lower quality. So this is giving them the decision making to, to be able to differentiate the products. So finally, a, a use case around uh, wheat here counting. So this is specifically, this is looking at estimating how much crop could be yielded from a particular field just from, from uh, drawing imagery on the field. Uh, and again, how HPCs play involved in this is that uh, they're looking at a lot of data of this, this imagery and they need to be able to come up with a, a very complex model to be able to accurately count how many wheat ears do they see in that picture. So the drone can fly around the field and the farmer, again, he doesn't just get video imagery up from the drone, he gets a count of how many wheat ears or how much crop he has in his field. And that's done from the algorithms on the camera. So the current status of the project is we're in month 29. Um, the, technology, the technical architecture has been built and it's deployed across uh, several HPC facilities across Europe. Um, we're evaluating the technology, so that's the usability of it and the business impact benefits to the nine demonstrators. We're doing that right now, and the results should be, should be out by the end of the year. But the initial results are very, very encouraging, um, particularly around uh, the, the, the food safety value chain, pig production, the open sea fishing. Um, uh, we're, what we're hoping to do is bring this technology to market uh, early 2022, um, and to, to assess it with these ag tech companies that want to get into the HPC space. Um, so that's you know a whistle stop tour of the Cybell project. Um, it's really excited to, to present it here today uh, to you, and, and I'm happy to take any of your, your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Davy, uh, for this insightful presentation of the project. Um, I'll keep the questions uh, for later at the end of both presentations. And uh, now I'll, uh, I'll just uh, give the floor to Dr. Zapata to talk about water to return, and then we'll move to the Q&A sessions for both projects. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot. I'm sharing the screen. One second. Okay. Do you see it already? Yes, now we do. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, I, I would like to introduce you a uh, Water Treatment Project, which is uh, uh, coordinated by, by Biosul. And I would like to explain uh, uh, different aspects of the project itself, but uh, I would like to start with the reasoning why we decided to write this proposal and uh, and 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 build up this system uh, because uh, as mentioned before uh, why we 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 uh, bet for water to return as mentioned before we are a, a wastewater uh, treatment uh, company among other things and we are quite quite aware of the of the uh, wastewater effluent how it is how it works and therefore about its potentiality. We are aware it's uh, uh, a resource. Um, it can be considered actually a resource because it's a source of nutrients that can be used, for example, in agriculture. Uh, when thinking about different kinds of industries in which this uh, wastewater was, uh, was actually as well a problem for them because they were producing a lot and they had to do something with, with it, uh, food industry came quickly to our mind, especially the European slaughtering sector, because they consume a lot of water and also a lot of energy, and they produce large amounts of uh, waste and wastewater. And when thinking about this and thinking about agriculture and the challenges it, it, it's, it's facing uh, currently and it will face in the future, because by, by 2050, uh, uh, world population will reach 9.1 billion people. These people will have to be fed, and it will have it will happen in a context in which uh, of climate change, in which uh, the uh, uh, rural labor force will be smaller. There will be land limitations, soil degradation, etc. And also, we have the additional uh, issue of the chemical fertilizers. Uh, the demand is uh, is increasing quite a lot but they can mm, be dangerous for the environment if they, for example, uh, go into the any water body. So when mixing all these things together and going back to the slaughtering industry and thinking, okay, which is the current approach for treating this wastewater? What do they do with it? They basically, in, in generally speaking, uh, tend to, to, to get rid of, uh, of the treated water by fulfilling the, the legislation and therefore they also dispose these nutrients. And there is uh, an alternative, more sustainable and um, uh, framed within a circular economy approach, which can be the system water to return. Uh, it provides a market opportunity, a new market opportunity for the slaughtering industry because they, they may have a new product, let's say, to, let's say to, to sell. Um, it adopts a circular economy approach, extracting the maximum value from the slaughterhouse's effluence and also makes possible to recover nutrients uh, and turn, turn them into uh, value-added products for the agricultural sector. So. In a nutshell, what is water to return? It proposes an integrated solution for treating uh, this wastewater from the slaughterhouse while recovering nutrients. This way, we can consider uh, the wastewater treatment facilities inside these bigger industries may be uh, turned into biorefineries. Uh, it is an, an innovation action co-funded by the European Commission under Horizon 2020 program. It is built, as mentioned, on a bottom-up approach based on a current market demand. It started by July 2017. It will finalize by March 2022. And, uh, uh, well, uh, the Commission will, will cover uh, practically 6 million euros from the 7 million euro uh, budget. And it's coordinated by, as mentioned, by, by, by a sole company. So what is the system itself? It's composed of uh, three treatment lines plus an energy recovery module. Each of these treatment lines have a concrete, uh, produce a concrete secondary raw material that can be the basis for manufacturing ag an agronomic products. 
So let's go line by line. The first one is called waterline. And it's because it is the first one treating directly wastewater from the slaughterhouse. Uh, in this case, we treat uh, the wastewater and obtain a nutrients concentrate, which will constitute secondary raw material number one, with which we will manufacture a biofertilizer. What happens in here? We have uh, two big uh, uh, parts of this treatment line. On the one hand, an SPR, which is a wastewater treatment technology plus a filtration unit. When treating the water in the in the SVR, we obtain uh, uh, two parts, let's say. Uh, one of them is the treated water that goes to the filtration unit, and from there we obtain the nutrients concentrate, and the other part is a sludge. The sludge will be feeding the following treatment line, which is called sludge line. In this case, we have a pre-treatment plus a fermenter, and what will happen here is that uh, the sludge generated by the SVR from the water line uh, will go through a fermentation process with bacillus. We will obtain, on the one hand, a solid fraction. It will be a secondary raw material to further manufacture a biostimulant. And the liquid fraction will fed the anaerobic uh, uh, digester that constitutes uh, 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 the energy recovery module, and we will generate uh, energy as well. But within this uh, anaerobic digestion process, there is CO2 which is released, and it's captured by the algae line. In this case, this microalgae uh, included in the in the um, in the algae line will capture CO2 and get feed of uh, of, of of it, and uh, we will obtain a microalgae biomass, which is secondary raw material number three, and it will be a biostimulant as well. So these agronomic products will be free of uh, pathogens, heavy metals, and it should be ready for uh, commercialization at European and international level. Key innovations, of course, the integrated treatment system with the three treatment lines, the three secondary raw materials, and the three agronomic products. These constitute a new business model based on a circular economy approach and on industrial symbiosis because two sectors that in principle should not be really re related among them uh, at the end they can benefit each other from uh, collaborating uh, so it provides business opportunities to wastewater treatment sector energy engineering consultancy companies manufacturers of agronomic products slaughterhouses meat industry uh, where are we working actually? <laughs> we are uh, working on a demonstrator which is located in a real slaughterhouse, real working slaughterhouse called Matadero del Sur. It is located in Salteras, which is a municipality nearby Seville city in the south of Spain. It has a treatment capacity of 50 cubic meters per day out of the 150 of the total daily flow of the slaughterhouse. We are treating only one third because this is an innovation action project. So we have demonstrators and not uh, uh, a real scale applications. That is why we only treat uh, one third. And this is the appearance, <laughs> how it looks like at, at this point. So. What we saw in the scheme is, is included in here, and I will show you picture by picture each of the systems. This is a complete uh, um, uh, water line with the SVR and the different tanks and, uh, well, the filtration unit, you cannot see it there because it's uh, on the other part. Um, this is the, the, the complete water line. This is the fermentation uh, unit, the sludge line followed by the energy recovery module with the anaerobic digester. And the big pond <laughs> is the algae line. The two small ones are the inoculum ponds. And then um, this is what we are uh, working on at this point. Results up to now. The whole system is installed, as you have, as you have seen. Waterline is properly running uh, since the first half of 2020. Uh, we set uh, an analytics protocol to check how the treatment was, was working, and it's uh, um, uh, constantly applied uh, since September 2020. The sludge line is currently being started up, and the initial results will be will be available soon. And the anaerobic digestion tests on site because 
there were several ones at uh, lab level, are being started up uh, at this moment. Uh, so, what can we say about uh, the available results up to now that comes from the water line? Uh, according to the regulation, uh, we can um, uh, we have to fulfill uh, uh, one out of two conditions. We have to fulfill the concentration of different parameters within the treated water or a percentage of reduction. These are the parameters that have to be checked, biological, uh, biochemical oxygen demand, a chemical oxygen demand and total suspended solids. So when checking the effluent uh, um, from September to May, uh, we can see that all samples fulfill legislation either regarding the concentration or regarding the percentage of reduction. In most of the cases, uh, the concentration uh, of BOD uh, is um, uh, below the permitted levels. And in those cases in which it doesn't happen, they, they fulfill the percentage reduction. The same happens with the uh, chemical uh, oxygen uh, demand. Uh, and the same happens with the total suspended solid. So the treatment, uh, wastewater treatment is, is, is running properly. And um, we are currently setting up the, the, the fermenter to see how much we can produce, uh, because this is the next step to see how much we can produce in, in, and find out if we can take this to the uh, uh, marketable scale for uh, the agricultural products manufacturer. So potential clients of the system, it's actually a um, very flexible system because uh, we can uh, um, install the, the whole thing, but we can also think about uh, each concrete situation and install part of the modules or the treatment lines. And it's highly replicable because uh, the kind of uh, wastewater we can find in, for example, so the houses or meat processing industry is very similar. So at the very beginning, at first stage, uh, the early adopters, of course, would be other slaughterhouses and, and in the second stage, meat processing industries and, of course, uh, other beneficiaries would be agronomic products distributors and obviously the, the, the farmers. Um, this is the consortium we have. This is the, the geographical distribution. And um, that's all from my side, I think. <laughs> so if you have questions, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much. They're both uh, very interesting projects, very highly innovative. So really, thank you for sharing the knowledge with us. Um, so yeah, uh, I've got uh, a few questions, but before that, is there something, some curiosity that you would like to ask the other project or you're interested in? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a really, really interesting um, presentation. Um, uh, like really, really innovative way of, of upcycling. So something that, you know, people are just trying to get rid of, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that uh, there was there was a, an element of kind of capturing CO2 as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, you know, to, to me, that's that's a really important topic as well, which, which you know, you know, not not just kind of recycling, but also just with, with climate action, trying to um, trying to capture some of the carbon that's in the atmosphere. Uh, so I guess, you know, have, have you is there a way to maybe perhaps have, have a mechanism like that more standalone or to have kind of more CO2 capturing using that approach in, in other industries? Well, in, in this case, it is designed in a way in which the CO2 capture goes directly uh, to the Elgai pond. So we use it, on, it's not a way of, um, it's the aim is not, capturing the CO2 to not be released to the environment, which is like a, a secondary uh, um, uh, um, purpose, obviously, and it's uh, good for the environment, but it's it's the idea is taking it to feed the algae directly, because if right. not, the algae treatment does not work properly. It's feeding mm. the algae uh, uh, growing there. So obviously, as a secondary impact, uh, obviously, it's, it's very important uh, for the project because we are 
again, talking about the circular economy, and it's important to, to, to take it into account, but it's not the primary uh, mm, uh, objective of, uh, of this part. Okay, it's really interesting to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Zapata, do you have some questions? Well, it, it, it's actually uh, quite impressive for me because it's it's true when when talking with the with the farmers and and with the manufacturers and associations and so on, uh, it's true that uh, farming sector is in, in including these technologies uh, uh, progressively, and I, I, I'm not sure if if. It's still very difficult to 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 bring people on board to actually test this kind of technologies, yeah. or if you have still a barrier regarding you know traditional farming and 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 so on. Because I don't know if if including technologies in this field is is always easy, or it's if it is easy everywhere. Yeah, no, there's there's definitely. Um... It's definitely much more difficult because like, you're going like, up against an industry that's very traditional. Like what we would find, particularly in, in Ireland, where we're looking at the dairy mm -hmm. industry, um, they, they would, they, you would have a cohort that are very, you know, ambitious with taking on technology, um, but the vast majority would be a bit more reluctant, a bit more um, mm -hmm. uh, hesitant. Uh, so what we find is, you know, delivering really convincing use cases. Uh, showing where they really see the value um, and try to make it as easy as possible for them to adopt this technology. Uh, so the vast majority would have smartphones, for example. So can we integrate with the smartphone as, as much as possible? Yeah. Um, and, to, you know, to, to make it very, very easy for them, really that, that, that's what our, our main uh, objective is. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I I personally think that both projects are based on a sort of data collection from stakeholders. Uh, so, of course, engaged in the agricultural sector. So I was also wondering, like, how do you engage or did you engage with them to retrieve data? And uh, how would you push them to adopt these technologies in both projects? This is uh, somehow complicated uh, because uh, in our case, we're talking about wastewater. And this word is like quite ugly for, for everyone. No, it's, mm. Mm, are you going to irrigate something? It's not the case in this project. But when you talk about treating wastewater and use reclaimed water for irrigation, which is another possibility, people get a little bit reluctant because you're talking about wastewater. Uh, and this is very difficult sometimes to 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 overcome. And when approaching stakeholders, because um, obviously you have to explain, okay, uh, we we are going to use this wastewater. We are going to produce some some agronomic products that you will be able to use in the uh, on the field. It's complicated. Uh, so we are um, elaborating different kinds of uh, stakeholders uh, surveys uh, divided by sectors. Uh, we have diff five different kinds of, of um, surveys. This is also very important for us for all the activities regarding market potential, business models and so on, and social acceptance, because um, it will be the way of actually building uh, our business model that will be divided into smaller ones. So we are trying to approach them, make this, um, we will have uh, two kinds of training workshops and seminars for, uh, for stakeholders to actually get also information from them, know what are their main concerns and so on, to actually build up this, uh, this uh, business model strategy. Yeah, it's always very difficult because it, that's the idea in people's mind that need to be changed a little bit or yeah. open to these new possibilities that are new to anyone. So, of course, it's quite ch a challenging task. <laughs> uh, Dr. Yeah. David, would you like to add something? Yes. Yeah, yes. absolutely. I think, you know, and you mentioned that education is, is such an important aspect of this as well. And, you know, educating... Uh, the industry on the value of the data that they have, that, that even if they don't know they have this data, um, just, I guess, the, the first is just educating them on the value of the data and what could be achieved if they were willing to, to, to share this data. 
Uh, and then on the other hand, you have perhaps you have industries that, that they are collecting data, they're processing it themselves, but they're very reluctant to share it. Um, because they would be saying, you know, potentially that data is their, their, you know, their uh, their value proposition, or it's their, you know, their intellectual property, or it's their commercial uh, uh, head. Um, so it's 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 showing as well if they if they can share to some degree that they can benefit not just themselves but their their, their whole sector. Um, and I think that that's definitely another important message to be able to communicate as well. Um, if you can share your data. Uh, you know, everyone can benefit. Yeah. yeah, I was, I was wondering in the case of the of of the Cybel project, um, because obviously the system is based on data collection, storage, transmission of data. So, uh, how do you deal with security and privacy threats? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the aspects of the project deal, deals with security. Um, and what we do, we do is we let's say we have a, an organization that has data and they want to be able to share it on our platform they can actually uh, f firstly it's 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 maintaining a secure database uh, so we, we we manage access to that database very very clearly we're actually using blockchain technology to allow them to uh, you know really securely uh, give grant someone, uh, you know, a short-term access to that data, or to grant certain permissions of access to that data. So, you know, really central to the project is this idea of if you're sharing data, you're sharing it on your own terms, and they can define who gets to access the data uh, and how they can access it. Uh, and this is again, we're integrating blockchain technology into this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, I have another question for uh, the water to return. Um, I was wondering what role do the geographical differences play in this? Because I guess it, it can it affect the treatment of the wastewater in terms of the availability of facilities or water different water conditions and so on. Well, the main difference is between our demonstrator and other potential installations. I mean, the composition mm, uh, will be more or less the same. Uh, there will be no, no big differences, but the concentration will be different, of course, because it will depend not only on the amount of, of, uh, of animals slaughtered, but also the kind of animals are slaughtered. This can vary a, a little bit. So therefore, it's that is why this system is so so uh, tailor made for every potential client because we have to check a little bit what they what they have and starting from that, we can uh, design one kind of installation or or or, or another. But um, when talking about slaughterhouses the difference should not be too big to actually replicate it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, now we've got a question for both of you. Uh, what kind of uh, technical or non-technical challenges have you faced during the projects, during the implementation of the project? Uh, Dr. Davy, you can start if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think, I think um, right across Europe, a lot of research projects, particularly ones that involve demonstrators, were were impacted by COVID. Um, as well, we're we're all working from home, but um, the pilots where we had to go out and collect data or or interact with farmers in the field that was quite challenging. And uh, in, in fact, you know, we we found that we had to kind of reorganize the project uh, to be able to deal with that. So in areas where uh, you know, um, big, big organizations were coming out of lockdown. Uh, they, you know, we were able to prioritize data collection in those areas. Um, so that would that would be one. And I think that you know, it's it, it it shows you know a really strong consortium if you're able to deal with such a shock like that to the organization and still be able to progress and and and, and work on time. Um, another aspect I think was, um, you know, I guess being able to 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 you know, we, one of the use cases we had in mind, we had to actually change direction for the use case. Uh, you know, you know, during the middle of the project, um, and just to make sure that 
that new use case aligned to the project's objectives and goals. Um, and, you know, just, I guess it was a rigorous progress to, to go through. Um, so that's kind of from, from the kind of the, the non-technical side. From the technical side, uh, one of the main challenges we had is, again, what we're trying to do is build these abstractions over high-performance computing. Um, but high-performance computing, different centers in, in, in Europe, they have very different ways to interact with them, very different ways to be able to use them. Um, and that was quite a challenge as well to be able to, you know, develop something that could abstract those those quite, quite drastic differences, um, so that from a customer perspective, it, you know, they were able to deploy some piece of software, and it didn't really matter which HPC they deployed onto. Um, so that was a, an interesting challenge that we had to overcome as well. Do you mean also for users to use these softwares and get used to how they work as well? Yeah, it, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, for, for example, one of our users would be a, a typical data scientist. That they might have experience in, in using uh, machine learning libraries or Python, which, you know, is a software development uh, language. Um, but to be able to run that, it's very different to run that on your own computer or on your own server than to on a HPC. Uh, so we want to try and make that very seamless. So what they did run on their server, they could run on a HPC. So taking that and transforming it into that mechanism so it could run on a large uh, system as well. That's all, you know, that was really core to the, the challenge that we were trying to solve. Yeah, that's quite a big challenge. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Tapata, would you like to say something about yeah. it? Well, in, in, in our case regarding uh, non-technical issues, obviously this year has been a challenge for everyone in every single aspect, you know, uh, trying to build up and run a demonstrator uh, from home, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not possible. So we have also extended the project a, a little bit because and reorganized things be because of this. But regarding non-technical issues, non-related with this special situation, again, we are talking about two sectors a little bit complicated regarding social acceptance and, and, and so on. One of them is wastewater, another one is slaughtering industry, which is not uh, um, very popular as well for many people. Uh, so we have uh, working not only on, uh, in, on environmental assessment, of course, but not only life cycle assessment or life costing uh, cycle costing but also social life cycle assessment because it is a very very important aspect in our case uh, because if we, if we want uh, to actually have a, a market we need people to understand how it is why it works and why it's beneficial uh, at the same time we are talking about two industries that is why we have the trainings i was mentioning before in which okay wastewater uh, um, uh, slaughtering industry okay they have wastewater they want to treat them whatever you do afterwards it's 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 okay but they they, they do not see the whole picture uh, sometimes because they they focus on their concrete uh, situation and the same happens with farmers okay well we, we want a fertilizer or a biostimulant uh, it's not really up to me whenever it comes and, and why it's important I use this one and not another one. So this, um, again, raising awareness is, is very important. And, and from the technical point of view, basically, when we make, uh, when we wrote the proposal and, and obviously we have to make assumptions about how much of every single uh, uh, nutrient or, or how the composition is going to be, of the wastewater, how much we can obtain, how this can work, which is going to be a yield or the efficiency of the system. And then when you uh, face reality, you realize that maybe some of these things are not the same as you were imagined before. Uh, so you have to readapt a little bit, but uh, well, it's, it's something that happens in any kind of demonstration project. So yeah, Nothing. that's <laughs> that's the struggle between theory and yeah. practice, I guess. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, oh, we have a question from uh, Anne uh, de Moisy. I apologize for the pronunciation. Um, she's asking, what do you consider as the main issues when using ML models for wet ear counting? 
Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. So, I guess it's for yeah for the, yeah, the Uyghur yeah. county. Um. So so yeah. So the the, the organisation in that is the University of Strathclyde in in Glasgow, of course, or in, in Scotland. Um. So they're using uh you know convolutional networks um to be able to look look at these and they're you know what they're looking at is it's it's wheat here counting um uh it's it's semantic segmentation is the technique that they're 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 using so you look at a, a picture and you try to enable each pixel in the frame uh is it wheat or is it just part of the background or is it part of the leaf or part of the stalk um and so, so that initially that's kind of what the, the algorithms they're using and they're they're training this on you know drone imagery data you know uh, collecting uh, images by hand labeling the image by hand and then getting the their algorithms to be able to perform these kind of semantic segmentation masks um the difficulty in in the project as as with many of them is getting access to the data and labeling the data um uh, and also making sure that their their algorithm can be generalized to uh, you know crop produced in in other regions or in other areas, uh, so it's taking account of you know daylight, um, potentially shadows on the on the fields. So there's s some of the challenges that they're uh, looking into. Thank you, Dr. Davy. Thank you very much. Um, now I've got one last question. Um, which moves a little bit away from the technicality of the projects themselves. Um, what's the best part of working in a European project for you? Dr. Zapata, you can start if you want to. Well, I think it has actually a lot of advantages. And I'm talking as a company, let's say, because when you come from an SME, it's complicated sometimes to test uh, new things in uh, different environments or geographical areas or different industries because there is uh, a lot of risk actually you have to invest uh, and 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 it's complicated if you are a small company but when you build up a group in which you have the best researchers, the best uh, end users and uh, the best ideas all together and you have the, the European Commission, just up there, uh, trying to, to, to help you, financing you, is, is really, really useful, I think, for everyone. Obviously, you also enlarge your network of, of contacts. You get in touch with people with which maybe you would have never had the chance uh, to, to, to connect, and you realize about the potentiality of your ideas, actually. And it's ready from the... Per from, yeah, now, from from a personal point of view, really enriching because you 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 know a lot of realities that maybe you were not aware of. And I'm also talking about uh, the work with the other countries outside Europe, with which we work uh, a lot. We have this opportunity, and uh, you realize how they face the technological and non-technological uh, challenges in a very different way. And then it's 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 very enriching, actually. Yeah, it's great because it, it kind of makes you open your mind to of loads of possibilities. <laughs> Dr. David, would you like to add on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, I think it's it's that, you know, and, and again, just, just to mirror um, Pillar's comments, it's that access to expertise. Um, you know, th these are some of the best researchers in Europe that we're working with uh, and they're tackling these really, really difficult problems. Um, and also, when you're when you're when you're working with NGOs or businesses, you can see, you know, firsthand the impact that these results of the projects are going to have. You know, in some instances, it's going to be completely transformative to the businesses and make them a lot more cost effective, a lot more efficient. And to get that feedback during the project is is amazing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you for your inputs. And uh, okay, so. I guess we got to the end of the episode. I really thank you both for accepting our inv invitation to the series. And uh, thank you very much for your contribution. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'll just wrap up and uh, I'll uh, wait uh, 
well, we'll see one another for the next in the next episode next week. And uh, thank you very much again, Dr. Davy and Dr. Zapata, for being here today. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot to you. <laughs> Have a nice day. Thank Same you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.